So let's take a look at what happens when the air gets to the alveoli. Um, so just to recap, um, what we learned so far is the air would uh, uh, enter through the nasal cavity, goes through the pharynx, the larynx, uh, the trachea, then the trachea will branch into primary, secondary, tertiary, bronchus, uh, and then uh, eventually it will become the bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchiole is where you will find the uh, alveoli. Um, the alveolar sac is made up of uh, simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so uh, simple squamous means a single layer of really, really uh, flat and thin cells, and that's ideal because we're trying to do uh, gas exchange here. Um, so uh, uh, the um, uh, diagram here shows you uh, we have the pulmonary arterial, which is of course from the pulmonary uh, artery um, coming off from the heart, uh, carrying the blue blood, the oxygen poor blood, uh, and then at the um, capillaries here surrounding the alveoli, uh, that's where gas exchange will occur. So the uh, 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 oxygen will go into uh, the bloodstream from the alveoli, uh, and the carbon dioxide from the blood is going to go into the uh, alveoli, uh, and then the blood will now become oxygenated, uh, which would then return to the heart through the pulmonary uh, uh, vein. So in order for gas exchange to take place, um, the inside of the alveoli must remain moist. There has to be a way for the oxygen to dissolve into the, uh, uh, the moist layer before it goes into the blood. Uh, but that actually creates a bit of a problem. So let me uh, explain um, this to you on a, on a diagram. Um, let's uh, draw an alveoli. Okay, so here we have an alveoli. And like I said, um, the inside uh, of the alveoli is going to have a a coating of um, of water, right, to to keep it moist, to allow the oxygen to dissolve in it, uh, and so you know you're gonna have some water molecules here. Uh, you probably learned this from chemistry class. Um, water molecule looks like this uh, is H2O, so there is an oxygen here and then two hydrogen, uh, but due to uneven sharing of electron, the um, oxygen is slightly negative compared to the um, hydrogen and that makes this molecule uh, polar and what happens is when you have polar molecules uh, like water uh, next to each other they are actually going to be attracted to each other so um, imagine this is like a like a, a plastic bag and then you have magnets on the inside and all these magnets all these water molecules uh, because they're polar they're going to be attracted to each other so that actually uh, uh, creates what we call surface tension. Uh, and surface tension, in this case, is going to um, cause the alveoli to collapse. Uh, and if you have too much surface tension, uh, you are going to um, uh, have a difficult time uh, inhaling. So surface tension is going to uh, 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 impede is going to impede uh, inhalation. That means it's going to um, uh, kind of make it more difficult for inhalation, right? Uh, but because it's causing the alveoli to collapse, it actually will help help with uh, help with exhalation. Okay. So we uh, we don't want too much surface tension. So uh, in order to uh, counteract the surface tension, there are cells called septo cells um, that would secrete an oily substance um, called surfactant. So the surfactant uh, is going to break some of these surface tension and kind of provide an opposing force uh, to it. Okay, so uh, these are surfactant. Okay, so surfactant will uh, help with help with um, inhalation by breaking the surface tension but you know having too much surfactant is not necessarily a good thing because it will impede it will interfere with um, uh, uh, exhalation okay so um, you have to have the right amount right ratio of surf of um, uh, surface tension and surfactant in order for uh, breathing to uh, to occur uh, properly um, and Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, that's the surfactant I was talking about. You can read through these uh, uh, notes yourself. Um, 
when babies are born prematurely, um, their lungs actually do not uh, have not produced sufficient surfactant yet, uh, and that uh, could make it impossible for them to breathe. Uh, and when that happens, we call it the infant respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so people, were, um, pe baby who are born um, prematurely, are often going to be given uh, some steroids um, uh, through the nose as soon as they are born, uh, and that steroids kind of uh, act as um, an artificial surfactant uh, that would open up their lungs and help them to breathe. Um, and this would continue uh, until they are able to make their own um, surfactant. So the lungs, um, we labeled it earlier and I told you that um, you have uh, two lungs, uh, one on the right and one on the left. And the right lungs are going to, is going to have three lobes uh, uh, separated by these uh, lines, which we call fissures. Uh, so there's a horizontal fissure here, sideways. Uh, we have a, um, a slant or oblique fissure here. Um, so you have superior lobe, middle lobe, and inferior lobe. Uh, on the other side, um, uh, you know, the lungs is uh, slightly smaller because it, it's making room for the uh, for the heart, uh, and we only have two lobes: um, the superior lobe and the interior lobe, inferior lobe. So the lungs are surrounded by a double layer membrane called the uh, pleura. Uh, singular is pleura, uh, and just like the heart, this membrane is a double layered membrane. Um, so you have the layer that is in direct contact with the lung. We call that the visceral pleura, uh, and uh, outside of that, you will have the parietal pleura. So, uh, in between the layers, you will have some fluid, and this fluid helps lubricate um, the two membranes. So, when they rub against each other, uh, it's not going to um, have wear and tear. You're not going to be uh, experiencing any kind of pain, uh, and that uh, lubricating fluid is called the pleural fluid. Okay, the pleural fluid, in addition to um, uh, providing lubrication uh, between the membrane, uh, also uh, creates uh, surface tension that holds the two uh, layers of the pleura together. So imagine this: um, if you have one uh, 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 plastic uh, film, uh, and then there's another one here. If you try to uh, pick up one. Um, of them with the other um, is, is not going to happen easily. But if you put some water in here and then you stick them together, uh, then the surface tension will keep the two surfaces together, right? Um, uh, and that's exactly what the pleural fluid is doing. It allows the two films uh, of the membrane to, to be stuck to uh, each other. So when one membrane moves, the other is going to, uh, to move with it. So this is uh, another view. You can see um, there is the lung here, and uh, uh, directly touching the lung, which is this right here, that is going to be your visceral pleura. And uh, 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 outside of that, this is the parietal pleura. Um, and the two membrane, um, the space in between, is going to be filled with the uh, pleural fluid. So uh, let me just change the color here. This space here between the two membranes, that's where the pleural fluid is going to be. So the visceral pleura is going to be stuck to the lungs, while the parietal pleura is going to be stuck to the inside of your uh, chest cavity. So when your chest goes out, um, the uh, parietal pleura will pull the uh, visceral pleura with it. And so when your chest goes out, your lungs will uh, be pulled out along with it as well, uh, which means when you move your chest, you are going to be able to change the volume of the lung as well. And that is important um, to uh, create a condition necessary for breathing, uh, which I'll explain more later. And the same thing is going to happen at the bottom with the diaphragm. Uh, when the diaphragm goes down, um, it will pull the lungs uh, down with it. Uh, because of the pleura. So if your pleura is damaged, if there is a stab wound or something, um, and so the liquid no longer no longer holds the uh, membranes together, then uh, your chest will move, but then your lungs will no longer move with it, uh, and you won't be able to breathe uh, uh, that way. So there are some factors that affects uh, airflow uh, um, that, that affects um, how easy it is for air to go in and out of your system. Uh, and the first one is what we call Boyle's Law. Okay, so Boyle's Law uh, basically states that uh, at constant temperature, there is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. 
What that means is if the temperature doesn't change and, you know, in the human body is 37 degrees, so that's constant. Uh, uh, when the temperature is constant, then um, when you increase the volume, you are going to have a decrease in pressure. Okay. So similarly, if you decrease the volume, you're going to end up increasing the pressure. So there is an inverse relationship um, between, um, between uh, volume and pressure when the temperature is constant. So that's important uh, when it comes to breathing, uh, and we will um, explain that in a little bit more detail later. Now, there are two pressure um, that is important when it comes to uh, breathing. Okay, So anytime you have a, um, a pressure difference between two points, right? Uh, we call that a pressure gradient. And typically speaking, uh, fluid will flow from high pressure, high pressure, high P, to low pressure. Okay, so the two pressure that we're uh, going to look at is what's called atmospheric pressure. That is PA. Uh, that's basically the pressure um, of the atmosphere, of the air, of the surrounding. And then there is the intrapulmonary pressure, uh, which is uh, PI. That's the pressure within your lungs. So when PA, when the outside pressure is greater than PI inside your lungs, then air will go from the high, higher pressure to the lower pressure. So when atmospheric pressure is greater than lung pressure, then you are going to be inhaling. Okay, you'll be able to inhale. You breathe in, air rushes into your lungs. Um, conversely, if atmospheric pressure is lower than PI, then it uh, the air will go from high pressure from the lungs to the outside. So you will be exhaling. Um, in order for you to breathe in and out, you must be able to create a pressure difference uh, between the outside and the uh, and the inside. The next factor that affects airflow is what we call compliance. Okay, and compliance is basically the ability for the lungs to expand. So something with high compliance means it's able to expand uh, easily. Right? Uh, and we need to be able to expand the lungs to accommodate the air that we inhale. Um, if you remember, um, the uh, 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 surface tension is what's causing the alveoli to, sh uh, to kind of contract and shrink. So uh, if we want more compliance, we want to reduce the uh, surface tension. So by having um, a surfactant, it will increase the compliance of the lung. So something like a, like a, one of these uh, aluminum bottles, it's, it's low compliance, okay? You, you blow air into it, it's not really going to expand, right? So that's not good for uh, accommodating air. Uh, something like a balloon would be um, uh, uh, very compliant, right? You blow air into it, it's going to expand to accommodate it. So we want the lungs to be, to be like the balloon, okay? To be compliant. And finally, uh, the last factor that uh, affects uh, airflow is resistant to airflow. Uh, so that has to do with the diameter of the airway. Um, the more unobstructed it is, the easier uh, it is for the air to flow through. Okay. So uh, if you have small diameter, small diameter, uh, that would mean a high resistant, high resistant. And uh, that would mean uh, it would be a low airflow. Okay? So if you have a stuffy nose, for example, or if you have an asthma attack, then um, the smaller diameter will make it difficult for air to flow in and out of your system. So now that we have uh, looked at the factors that affects airflow, let's take a look at uh, the mechanism for breathing in and out. Uh, if you take a deep breath, um, you will notice your chest rises. Um, so the question is, did your chest rise because you inhale or did you uh, raise the chest first and then uh, you inhale? Uh, the correct answer for that is um, you actually need to raise your chest first before the air can come in. So the chest along with the diaphragm, uh, they create the necessary conditions um, that's required for um, breathing to occur. So let's take a look at your diaphragm. As so your diaphragm, it's the muscle that separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal uh, uh, cavity. And uh, normally when it's relaxed, your uh, diaphragm is going to be dome shape. So this is dome shape and uh, this is a relaxed day. Okay? When you uh, contract your diaphragm, the diaphragm will move down and it will become flattened. It will become flattened uh, and uh, this is contract. 
So by flattening your diaphragm, you actually pull the lungs down with you. Okay, so the here I'm going to draw the lungs here. Okay, and when you flatten your diaphragm, uh, when you contract it, it goes down and it's going to pull the lungs down with you, with with it. Okay, so you can see by uh, contracting your diaphragm, you actually increase your lung volume. Okay. So in addition to this, uh, when you are inhaling uh, simultaneously, as the diaphragm moves down, your uh, 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 rib cage, your chest muscle, actually is going to go out and up. Okay, uh, and by doing that, it's going to pull the lungs with it because of the pleura, right? So if I if I have to draw this again uh, over here, okay, from the side, let's erase this thing. Um, if you look at uh, a person's lung. Okay, so this is this is this is the person, and then this is the the, the lung. Okay, that's the diaphragm. Uh, when you move the uh, chest out and up, okay, this is an exaggeration, uh, but basically what's going to happen is the rib cage goes out and up, the lungs will get pulled along with it. So this, uh, along with the diaphragm going down, is going to increase the volume of the lungs. Okay. So uh, based on Boyle's law, if you increase the lung volume, you will decrease the pressure in the lungs. That would be a drop in PI. Uh, if the pressure drops significantly uh, to the point where PI is less than atmospheric pressure, PA, then air will rush in. So you see, in order for you to breathe in, you must first drop the pressure. And to drop the pressure in the lung, you have to move your diaphragm and your chest. So when you take a deep breath, right, it feels like the air is moving in, uh, which causes your chest to rise. But in fact, is your chest rising, and as it's rising, the air is moving in to equalize the pressure um, between your the inside of your lung uh, and the atmosphere. So this uh, opposite happens when you are uh, exhaling, when you're breathing out. In order to exhale, your diaphragm is going to relax and push up. So it's going to resume its dome shape uh, and your chest is going to come down and in. And you can see in this picture, the lung volume is uh, going to be reduced. And when you reduce the lung volume, uh, Boyle's law tells you, you're going to be increasing the pressure. Uh, we are talking about the pressure in the lungs. So that's PI. And when PI is greater than PA, then uh, the air will rush out because it will go from the high pressure to the low pressure, and that's how you're going to uh, exhale. Uh, that's basically it's uh, 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 what I what I just told you. Uh, you can you can read that on your own. Let's take a look at a few scenario. Um, let's look at uh, why it is difficult to breathe at high altitude. Right, so let me uh, skip to the um, the one note here. Okay. So let's say uh, we have a we have um, we have a mountain here, okay? And so this is this is sea level, okay? Sea level, sea level, okay? So at sea level, uh, the pressure. I'm just going to make up some number, okay? Let's say the pressure is um, uh, 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 80 or something, okay? 80 units, whatever it is, okay? So uh, in order for you to breathe at sea level to inhale. Um, you must create a pressure in your lungs that's lower than uh, uh, 80, right? So your PI might have to drop to, say, 60 in order for you to breathe in. Okay, so that creates a, a pressure difference of a pressure difference of 20. Okay, so in order to drop the pressure, your lungs is going to have to expand, uh, um, and you can do that by contracting your diaphragm by uh, moving your rib cage out and up. Okay, so you're going to be able to breathe, right? Uh, now up here, high altitude. Okay, this is like top of the mountain. Okay, hop top of the mountain. Okay, so what's the atmospheric pressure up here uh, in the mountain? Is it is it higher? Is it lower? Well, at sea level, you have you have all these air on top of you, right? All these atmosphere on top of you pushing you down. So there is a lot of pressure. Uh, but up here, right? You have less. Uh, stuff on top of you, right? You have less atmosphere on top of you. And so the pressure compared to down here is going to be lower. So let's say uh, 70, okay, 70 instead of 80. So now uh, up here, you have the same set of lungs, you have the same chest. So um, if you try to breathe in and drop the pressure to 60, now you only have a pressure difference of 10, right? So uh, you are not going to be able to do 
uh, gas exchange as effectively. Okay, so that's why it is difficult to breathe at high altitude. Uh, and if you go really, really high, there's going to be a point that the air is way too thin um, that you won't be able to drop the pressure in your lungs uh, significant enough for gas exchange to take place. And so, you know, if you climb Mount Everest or something uh, up, up in the high altitude, you're going to have to wear an oxygen mask. Same thing for uh, airplanes, right? Um, the cabinets for airplanes are pressurized, but if um, the cabinet lose pressure, uh, then that's what those masks is for, right? It's to make sure that you are still going to be able um, to breathe. Let's talk about the urge to breathe. If you hold your breath uh, 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 long enough, eventually you're going to give in and start breathing again. So what triggers that urge to breathe? Um, you have a breathing center uh, located in the brainstem, uh, part of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata. Right? So we'll learn more about that in the nervous system uh, unit later on. But that's where the uh, breathing center is. And this center is going to be sensitive to uh, carbon dioxide level in the blood as well as hydrogen ion level in the blood. Okay, so uh, the gas that drives breathing is actually high carbon dioxide. Uh, um, uh, this center is actually not affected by low oxygen level. Is how much carbon dioxide you have uh, that triggers uh, 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 your breathing. So um, let let me explain something to you. Uh, if you think about how long you can hold your breath for, right? So you you take a deep breath and then you hold it. Uh, how long can you hold that breath for? Uh, for average person, I don't know, maybe like. Yeah, 20 seconds to 40 seconds, depending how uh, uh, physically fit you are, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, when, let, let's say this y-axis is the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, in blood. And over here on the x-axis, this is time. So when you take a deep breath and you hold it, then what's going to happen is, since you're not exhaling, then there's no way to get rid of carbon dioxide in your body, right? So the carbon dioxide level will just kind of uh, slowly climb up uh, over time as you're holding your breath. And what happens is we all have a threshold, okay? So this is, this is the threshold um, in, the, in the medulla oblongata. When it detects the carbon dioxide level to be uh, above the threshold, then it triggers your breathing mechanism and then you exhale. And then that's when you are going to release the carbon dioxide. So you can actually trick your uh, brain by uh, 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 hyperventilating, okay? So if you um, take a deep breath and then you exhale, and you do that 10 times, um, what you're doing is you're getting rid of carbon dioxide uh, more so than, than normal breathing would, okay? And then you hold your breath uh, at the 10th uh, uh, exhalation, okay? Um, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to hold your breath much longer. Because you were hyperventilating uh, by doing that, by br breathing out the carbon dioxide, your starting level is now much lower. So uh, when you hold your breath and you stop breathing, it will take a longer time before the body uh, uh, produces enough carbon dioxide to reach the threshold again. So if you were holding your breath for like 30 seconds before, now you might be able to increase it to like 60 seconds. Okay. So give that a try. Um, you know, just do it next to a bed or something in case you faint. <laughs> but it should should be should be relatively uh, uh, safe. So um, that um, uh, 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 respiratory center the, in the medulla oblongata, not only is it sensitive to carbon dioxide, it's also sensitive to hydrogen. So a little bit of chemistry for you. Um, so we know that uh, in cellular respiration, we produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So a lot of this carbon dioxide is actually going to combine with the water that's in our blood. And uh, from that, it will create uh, carbonic acid, H2CO3. Okay, so um, this acid, the H2CO3, H2CO3 is actually going to dissociate into H plus uh, ions as well as uh, bicarbonate ion. So when you have a lot of carbon dioxide, when you have a lot of carbon dioxide and you're not getting rid of it, that means you will have a lot of carbonic acid. Okay. Uh, and high carbonic acid will generate high H+. Plus. So if your medulla oblongata detects high H+, plus, that means you have too much carbon dioxide in your level. Um, that means you should breathe. You should uh, be exhaling those carbon dioxide. So now uh, that's the breathing center. 
In addition to the breathing center, we also have these chemoreceptors that are found uh, through, um, uh, in strategic locations. Okay? Chemoreceptors are basically sensors that detect chemical, and in this case, we're talking about detecting uh, oxygen. So uh, we have something called the carotid body, right? and the carotid body is located in the carotid artery. That's the one that um, feeds up uh, blood to, to the brain, and you also have carotid bodies located in the aorta. Okay? So when the oxygen concentration is very, very low, the carotid body will communicate with the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata so that you will increase the rate and the depth of breathing. Okay? So even though the medulla oblongata itself is only sensitive to carbon dioxide, um, we have kind of additional sensors um, to kind of urge the medulla oblongata should the oxygen level goes uh, uh, too low. Um, you can only hold your breath for so long, okay? Beyond certain points, uh, the um, uh, uh, voluntary control is going to be uh, uh, overridden by the autonomic uh, nervous system uh, uh, as soon as you lose your consciousness, okay? So like if a, if a, if a kid is like, I'm gonna hold my breath uh, uh, unless you give me chocolate cookies or something, okay? Um, so they might hold their breath and you know, they might actually pass out, uh, but as soon as they pass out, the uh, nervous system is go going to kick in and, and resume, uh, resume breathing. So now we are going to look at some uh, respiratory volumes uh, and the best way for me to explain this to you is to go to our workbook. Uh, let's go back to our workbook and we are going to be uh, looking at this graph. Okay. So um, if you uh, detect the amount of air that you breathe in and out, uh, um, um, we will see a graph that looks something like this, okay? And you can do so uh, through a spirometer. Um, that's basically, let me see if I have a picture of that. That's basically like this this machine here. You're gonna pinch your nose and you're gonna breathe in and out exclusively through the tube, and then the machine will register the volume um, that you're breathing in and out. So as we are just sitting there and uh, breathing in and out normally, uh, the amount of air that moves in and out uh, basically fluctuates um, uh, in, a, in a, uh, a constant manner. And this is what we call the tidal volume. Okay, tidal volume, T, uh, V, tidal volume. Okay, just like the, the tides of the oceans, right? It goes up and down, up and down. Okay, so you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Um, and when you're exercising, the tidal volume is going to uh, increase uh, because you're breathing deeper, right? And the frequency is also going to increase as well. Now, at the end of your next inhalation, if you continue to breathe in all the way, so take a deep breath, all the way until you cannot breathe in anymore, that extra bit of air that you just inhale, that is called the inspiratory reserve volume. Okay, all these uh, uh, acronyms, the, the full name is written in the PowerPoint slide, so you don't have to worry about it now. Uh, I'm just gonna use the short form. So this is the IRV, okay? That's the maximum amount of air that you can inhale beyond your regular inhalation, okay? So similarly, uh, if you were to exhale at the end of your regular exhalation, so breathe out as much as you can, that uh, extra bit of air that you breathe out, that is going to be your expiratory reserve volume, okay? Um, so from that point, from the lowest point, if you exhale as much as you can, uh, from that point, if you inhale as much as you can, all the way back up to the top, this whole uh, uh, volume, the amount of air from the lowest point to the highest point, that is called your vital capacity, okay? So vital capacity is basically uh, going to be uh, uh, one plus two, plus three, okay? These three things added together is your vital capacity, okay? That represent the total amount of air that you can move in and out of your lungs uh, voluntarily. Now, it's important to know that uh, even after you exhale as much as you can, uh, your lung volume is not gonna be zero, okay? There is gonna be some air that remains uh, within your, um, your, your lungs even after you breathe out as much as you can. Uh, this volume is called the residual volume. Okay, residual volume is also called uh, dead air uh, because it is very, very rich in carbon dioxide. Okay, uh, this air is useless. Right? Um, they, they they don't really come out. Um, 
uh, they just kind of hang around in the lungs uh, and it's taking up space right so they reduce the efficiency of gas exchange um, you don't want to have too much residual volume uh, and uh, as you can see later on uh, if someone is a heavy smoker uh, the amount of dead air in the lungs actually increase so the only time the dead air comes in is if you pop your lungs right so if there is an accident that caused your lungs to rupture uh, if there is a puncture wound that caused your lungs to rupture then the dead air comes out and even then even after the residual volume comes out um, there will still be some uh, 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 volume left in the lung right it's like having a, a paper bag right if you just leave the paper bag on the floor um, there is still going to be some volume inside right unless you deliberately squeeze them out so this um, this um, uh, 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 volume is called a minimal volume minimal minimal uh, volume Okay, so there are all the lung uh, volumes associated with um, the different breathing patterns. Um, so let's take a look at this. When you are exercising, how are, um, uh, this should be um, tidal volume, TV, the, how are tidal volume, uh, IRV, ERV, and VC affected? So take a moment and think about that. If you have thought about it, uh, then you uh, should, uh, the, the correct answer is when you're exercising, then the tidal volume is going to increase. Basically, it means that this, this red line is now going to be, to be here. Okay, this red line is gonna move up, right? Perhaps not that much, but you know, I'm just trying to uh, give you a visual view of what's going on. And this bottom red line is going to, is going to move down to here, okay? So this, this new area is going to be your, your tidal volume. And because of that, you are going to be reducing your IRV and you're going to be re reducing your ERV. So when you're exercising, uh, IRV goes, goes down, uh, ERV uh, goes down, uh, tidal volume goes up, but vital capacity remains unchanged, okay? because uh, the vital capacity is still from the lowest point to the highest point uh, and, and so you add up the numbers, it doesn't change. For someone suffering from emphysema, uh, what happens to their reserve uh, residual volume? So we're going to uh, talk about this in the PowerPoint. Uh, for now, that's all the uh, different volumes um, that, you, uh, that you have to know. So let's talk about smoking. Uh, smoking, uh, or tobacco, is the only legal consumer product that kills half of its regular users. I mean, that's kind of insane, right? If someone tells you um, there's a 50% chance that uh, using your cell phone is going to kill you, are you still going to use your cell phone? Maybe. I don't know. But uh, when it comes to tobacco, um, you know, a lot of people seem not to be bothered by that statistics. So globally, cigarette smoking kills 4 million people each year and about 70% of the death occurs in developing countries. Uh, and non-smokers are also affected um, because of secondhand smoke. Uh, and so, you know, Ontario passed a law saying that you, you cannot smoke in a car uh, if you have minors uh, uh, in your car as well. Uh, and that's to protect them from uh, inhaling secondhand smoke. Um, so here we can see uh, some statistics from 2016 uh, that globally, uh, uh, um, you know, um, male uh, smoking smoker, male smokers, uh, they are more concentrated in again uh, 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 some parts of the world uh, that are developing, uh, and uh, in fact, um, you have. Uh, uh, not as much as many smokers in North America um, than you would in uh, some other parts of the uh, of the of the world. Uh, and when it comes to women, it's a similar pattern. And women tends to uh, 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 there are, there aren't as many uh, female smokers as there are uh, uh, male smokers uh, in comparison uh, in many parts of the world. So what's the effect of smoking on the respiratory system? Well, one of the things that happens in uh, smokers is that the cilia that you found in the airway, they are going to be uh, damaged. Okay? And uh, if you continue to smoke, then you can see the uh, cilia are completely destroyed, uh, leaving behind scar tissues. Uh, and without the cilia, then you can't really remove pathogens right from your airway, uh, and that would increase your risk of getting various forms of uh, infection. So you might get uh, uh, bronchitis, you are more prone to getting pneumonia uh, uh, and other types of uh, infections. Um, you cannot remove allergens from the air, and so that would increase your risk of getting um, uh, allergies and asthma. Um, 
and you also cannot remove the, the mucus that you produce uh, from the gallbladder cells. Uh, and so the only way to get the mucus out of your body is to cough them up. And so there is that distinctive uh, smoker's cough that you might um, see uh, in long-term long -term smokers. Um, the cigarette smokes themselves actually also contains a lot of chemicals. Uh, and these uh, chemicals, uh, many of them are mutagens that are capable of causing mutations. Uh, and some of them are carcinogens, uh, which are um, likely to cause uh, cancer. So by smoking, you increase your risk of uh, developing mutations. And if significant number of mutations uh, accumulate uh, in your cells, then uh, it might uh, turn cancerous. So here is a normal uh, non-smoker lungs, and in a smoker's lung, you can see all the tar building up, uh, and all these things are uh, going to, of course, affect your respiratory uh, functions. Another thing that could happen is uh, in uh, smokers, uh, if it's a long-term smoker, eventually um, the alveoli are going to be destroyed. Okay? Um, so when the alveoli are destroyed, they left behind these uh, huge empty uh, spaces uh, uh, in the lungs. So these empty spaces are basically going to be uh, filled with carbon dioxide uh, and they will increase your uh, residual volume. So in the workbook there was a question asking how uh, how uh, emphysema is going to affect your residual volume. The answer is uh, it will increase the residual volume. So what is emphysema? Basically emphysema is a loss of elasticity. Uh, loss of elasticity in your lung tissue. Um, so um, it's instead of like uh, blowing air into a balloon uh, where when you let go of the neck of the balloon, the air automatically comes out. Uh, uh, for someone with emphysema, it's like blowing air into a paper bag. Okay? So you, you inflate the paper bag and then the air just kind of lingers inside. Right? So for people with uh, emphysema, uh, it becomes laborious. It becomes difficult to exhale the, uh, the, the air in them. Uh, and um, there is going to be a, a, a lot of residual volume in them, so they might not be able to exchange the um, uh, oxygen uh, efficiently. Uh, so uh, recently, there is the uh, introduction of vaping, and you know the question is: Are vaping actually uh, 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 safer or better? Well. Preliminary study shows that the use of e-cigarettes is actually unsafe for kids, teens, and young adults. Uh, a lot of them uh, still contains nicotine, and of course, uh, as you might know, nicotine is highly addictive. So uh, uh, you know, people might get the wrong sense of uh, of security that you know vaping is safer, so they might do it more often, uh, and then they get addicted to the uh, uh, nicotine, which then um, can interfere with uh, adolescent brain um, development. Uh, also, e-cigarettes uh, contains other harmful substances. Uh, in the States, there are several uh, deaths that are related to uh, 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 these other uh, ingredients in the, in the vaping oil that causes um, the lungs to form scar tissues. Uh, and so, you know, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, CDC is actually asking for a review of, uh, of the vaping products uh, uh, before they are, uh, uh, you know, promoted as a healthy alternative uh, to, uh, to, you know, traditional smoking. In general, um, smoking anything is probably not the best idea uh, for, uh, for the respiratory system. Uh, lastly, we have something called pneumothorax. Uh, in pneumothorax, the lung is uh, uh, collapsed because of a puncture wound. So if a knife goes in or something like that, uh, uh, that could cause the pleura to detach from each other. Um, so what happens is you, you're breathing, uh, your chest is going to move, but the lungs are not going to be able to move with it. Um, uh, typically speaking, uh, 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 external trauma can cause pneumothorax, but um, it can also happen spontaneously. Uh, sometimes your body has these things called cysts that can grow uh, pretty, much, pretty much anywhere. And the cysts, uh, they are kind of kind of gross, uh, actually. Um, they might have like hair in it. Sometimes they might even have teeth in it. Uh, and they could grow uh, on kidneys, on, uh, on ovaries, and on, uh, on, on the lungs, for example. And if you know, they get too big, they might pop. Uh, and the rupture of these small cysts can create a large enough force um, to cause uh, pneumothorax in some cases. Uh, and so, you know, you would have to uh, reinflate the lung and basically patch it up uh, uh, and, and wait for it to, uh, to close the wound before you can breathe properly uh, again. 
So one last thing uh, that we're going to talk about uh, is carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, uh, by law, uh, we have to have a carbon monoxide detector at home. Um, that's because carbon monoxide is a, is, a, is a poisonous gas and it could kill you. Uh, and to make it worse, uh, there is no smell to it, uh, there is no color to it, uh, and, and so you wouldn't be able to detect it um, yourself if you don't have a, a carbon monoxide detector. So if you do have a carbon monoxide detector, uh, it's best you put it um, at uh, where you sleep uh, because that's uh, the most likely place that you know you're gonna uh, be poisoned by carbon monoxide uh, if there are any in your house um, don't put it in the kitchen uh, because the cooking fumes can actually um, uh, affect how the sensor works so how does carbon monoxide cause you to become uh, to, to, to be poisoned uh, it turns out uh, carbon dioxide uh, carbon monoxide rather carbon monoxide uh, has a higher affinity to hemoglobin than oxygen which means in the presence of oxygen and carbon monoxide the hemoglobin will bind to carbon monoxide and not oxygen so you are not going to be able to deliver oxygen uh, throughout your body so some signs of carbon monoxide poisoning would be uh, having a headache uh, you might feel a little bit uh, nauseated uh, and uh, dizzy uh, and in severe cases you're gonna uh, lose consciousness. So that's why it's so dangerous, right? If you don't have a carbon monoxide detector at home. If you are home alone and you know you, you feel a little bit of headache and you feel nauseated and a little bit dizzy, most of us will perhaps take like a Tylenol or Advil and then go to sleep. And if the cause is carbon monoxide uh, 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 poisoning, and then that's very dangerous right, for you to go to sleep. So some sources of carbon monoxide gas in the house would be uh, from the furnace, right? Um, we, we should never run, keep the vehicle running in enclosed space because the exhaust contains carbon monoxide uh, and that gas could kill you. And uh, we should not be burning things uh, uh, inside the house. Um, you might remember several years back there is the uh, blackout uh, in the winter time and you know some people brought their propane burner into the house to uh, to keep themselves warm um, but whenever you try to do um, combustion whenever you try to burn thing, things without adequate uh, oxygen supply the byproduct is carbon monoxide uh, and people actually get poisoned as a result uh, of that. So that's it for lecture 4. Uh, thank you for watching.